Hello, and welcome to the History of Philosophy in India by Janardan Ganeri and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at www.historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, No Two Ways About It, Shankara and Advaita Vedanta. Some philosophers want to leave the world pretty much as they find it. They seek a deeper understanding of reality as it seems to be, putting their trust in everyday experience. Other philosophers want to overturn common sense. They believe that reality is actually very different from the way it may seem. These two approaches are often ascribed to the ancient Greek thinkers Aristotle and Plato, but the contrast could be applied, with at least as much accuracy, to the ancient Indian thinkers Shabara and Shankara, who were authoritative commentators of Purva Mimamsa and Vedanta. On the face of it, the two commentators belong to a single tradition, devoted to the interpretation of the earlier and later parts of the Veda. But Shabara and the Mimamsakas who followed him were implacable defenders of common sense. For them, the world is as we see it and has always been so. Shankara couldn't agree less. For him, the world is an illusion which masks the single underlying reality of Brahman. To accept the reality of the everyday world is ignorance or avidya. To know the sole reality of Brahman and the identity of the self or Atman with Brahman is to achieve liberation. What led Shankara to this astonishing view? Nothing but the authority of Vedanta, that is, the later parts of the Veda, the Upanishads. As Shankara never tires of insisting, his doctrine is stated quite clearly in numerous Upanishadic passages. He points to such texts as, Brahman is without a before and an after, without an inner and an outer. Brahman is this self here which perceives everything. Or, the finest essence here, that constitutes the self of this whole world, that is the truth, that is the self. Or, it is Brahman alone that extends over this whole universe up to its widest extent. Of course, other thinkers committed to the authority of the Vedas were well aware of these passages, but it was Shankara who put them at the heart of his understanding of Vedanta. Before him and after him, other Vedantins accepted that Brahman is the true, single source of all things, yet also that the world we see around us is real. For them, everyday reality emerges as a modification of Brahman, which has taken on the forms of the things we see around us. But Shankara denied that there could be two levels of reality, one more apparent and one more fundamental. Brahman is not two, it is single and supreme, unchanging and ineffable. Hence the name of the tradition founded by Shankara, Advaita, or non-dual Vedanta. His philosophical theory may be unprecedented and radical, but there's at least one thing about Shankara that could hardly be more familiar. We don't know exactly when he lived. The traditional date of his birth is 788 AD, which is probably a bit too late, but it's safe to assume he was active in the 8th century. This makes him a rough contemporary of Kumarela, the great exponent of Purva Mimamsa. Shankara wrote commentaries on several Upanishads and on the Bhagavad Gita, which, according to him, encapsulates the essence of the meaning of the whole Veda. The most celebrated work of Shankara, though, is without doubt his lengthy commentary, or Basya, on the Vedanta Sutra ascribed to Badarayana. You may feel it a bit unfair that we should have to wade through so much material only to find out that all of it, along with everything else, apart from Brahman, is unreal. If so, then a shortcut is offered by a far briefer introductory work called the Upadesha Sahastri, which encapsulates his teaching. On the other hand, it's well worth reading as much Shankara as you can, because he makes for great philosophical reading. Unlike the compressed and elliptical Vedanta Sutra, his commentary mounts elaborate arguments often in the course of refuting other schools of thought. Shankara also has a good line in analogies. He explains his fundamental idea that the apparent reality of everyday life is an illusion by comparing it to the foam on the surface of the sea, to the way that a sea shell may seem to be made of silver, and to the snake that upon further inspection turns out to be a coil of rope. 
To those who wonder how a single Brahman can make itself manifest as an illusory world, he responds that the single moon can appear as two moons to someone suffering from double vision. The individual soul that finally gives up its ignorance and accepts the true reality of Brahman is like a weary carpenter who lays down his tools, or a tired falcon that finally alights to rest. Shankara is also credited with founding four major centers of Hindu worship, taking a leaf from Buddhist monastic practices. The most famous of them is at Sringiri, where a beautiful temple was later built and still stands today. All of this has earned Shankara a leading place in the history of Indian religion and philosophy. Still, we should bear in mind that Advaita has been only one of many sub-schools within the larger tradition of Vedanta. Centuries later, there would emerge a rival approach, pointedly called Dvaita, dual as opposed to non-dual Vedanta. And already within a generation or two of his own life, Shankara was being heavily criticized by other Vedantins, including another major commentator on the Vedanta Sutra named Bhaskara. He was appalled by Shankara's tendency to abandon the ritualistic aspects of the Vedic tradition, which seemed to Bhaskara to be the inevitable consequence of deeming the world of actions and fruits to be a mere illusion. Modern-day scholars have discovered that, despite Bhaskara's disdain for Shankara and his Advaita approach, their two commentaries share a lot of common material. This suggests that both were drawing on a rich earlier tradition of Vedanta. Unfortunately, that tradition is otherwise largely lost, but we do know something about a precursor of Shankara named Gaudapada. We've been describing Shankara as a pivotal figure in the development of Vedanta, but in fact, many of his key ideas, and some of those nice analogies, are already found in Gaudapada. Shankara speaks of him with admiration, calling him by the title Paramaguru, which could mean he was the teacher of Shankara's teacher. But we don't need to get into the question of how much of the credit for Advaita should go to Gaudapada and how much to Shankara. For us, the questions are rather what this doctrine amounts to and whether there is any reason to believe it. On the latter question, Shankara is very clear. Just as Purva Mimamsa taught that matters of Dharma are taught only by the Veda, so Shankara says that we could never come to know the truth of Brahman if left to our own devices. Advaita is grounded in interpretation of the sacred texts, or Shruti, not in philosophical arguments. Since many of Shankara's rivals, like the Samkhya school, also accept the authority of Vedic literature, he frequently tries to refute them simply by quoting scriptures that fit better with his own view than with theirs. In fact, he even complains that Samkhya makes inferences from experiences of the world around us when it should be appealing to Shruti. For him, their empirical approach is wrong-headed. We cannot learn about Brahman from observation of the world because the world is precisely an illusion that masks Brahman. In itself, Brahman is formless, so even with the resources of revelation, it eludes both thought and speech. The closest we can come to an experience of Brahman would be an experience that is empty, utterly devoid of form. This is what happens in moments of deep sleep when we aren't even dreaming. While this may sound rather mystical and anti-rationalist, in another sense, Shankara is a philosopher's philosopher. Most ancient Indian thinkers, both within and outside the Rachmanical tradition, believed that even the deepest understanding needed to be combined with long practice. For Shankara, such things as meditation and ritual may be useful as steps along the path to liberation, but ultimately liberation is secured through knowledge. If you really come to understand that your individual self is identical to Brahman, you will immediately be freed from all suffering, and for that matter, from all pleasure. This is because Brahman is unchanging and remains unaffected by the processes and experiences that the individual self undergoes as a result of its ignorance. We reach liberation by being slowly weaned away from this individual self, giving up on such identifying features as caste, family affiliations, and even the desire to engage in ritual, since Brahman can, of course, never acquire the fruits of such rituals. You can see why a Vedic traditionalist such as Bhaskara was so annoyed by Shankara. As for us, we may have a different worry. Doesn't Advaita amount to a kind of nihilism? After all, Brahman is formless and ineffable, 
So when Shankara says that Brahman alone is real, he may seem to be saying that the only reality is nothing at all. But this isn't quite right. Though Brahman is not to be confused with the individual self, what Shankara calls the jiva, Brahman is still recognizably a kind of self. It is, for lack of better terms, consciousness or awareness. However, it is a special, pure kind of consciousness that is not aware of anything in particular. This becomes clear if we go back to Shankara's example of deep sleep. According to him, when we are asleep like this, there is not just pure emptiness. Rather, it is like an act of seeing without any visible object. Consciousness is evident to itself, even when there is nothing of which it is conscious, the way the sun is in itself luminous before it illuminates other things. This may seem a rather fine distinction. Does it make so much difference whether there is nothing at all, or nothing but a conscious self that is conscious of nothing in particular? To Shankara, it makes all the difference. This emerges from a remarkable critique of Buddhist thought found in his commentary on the Vedanta Sutra. The critique is remarkable in part because Shankara seems to be deeply influenced by Buddhism, or more likely to have absorbed Buddhist ideas indirectly from his predecessor Gaudapada. The Advaita rejection of everyday reality looks very Buddhist, as do its faith that liberation will ensue upon a proper understanding of the self, and its admission that Vedic ritual becomes irrelevant for the liberated person. With his dismissal of caste and family as aspects of the illusory self, Shankara also seems to be holding out a prospect of liberation to all people, just as the Buddhists did. This is problematic when it comes to the lowest class, the Shudras, since his authoritative text, the Vedanta Sutra, seems to exclude them from the path to liberation. Shankara admits that they cannot study the Vedas, but holds out the prospect of other forms of learning. As an aside, it's worth mentioning that in one of the many legends that surround the life of Shankara, it is told how he once shied away from touching a man of mixed caste because such people are impure. The man castigated him, reminding him that Shankara's own Advaita teaching implies that such distinctions are irrelevant to the true self. In any case, these borrowings from the Buddhists, which, remember, included Shankara's founding of monasteries around India, didn't stop him from attacking them on philosophical grounds. He complains that the Buddha taught several inconsistent theories, all of them false, perhaps because he was such a spiteful character that he deliberately wanted to confuse people. This breathtakingly rude remark suggests that Shankara felt no sympathy for the Buddhist tradition and that he didn't realize, or didn't care, that the supposedly inconsistent teachings he was attacking were in fact put forward by different rival strands within Buddhism. But if his critique is impolite and lacks historical nuance, it does manage to be philosophically astute. In a particularly interesting part of his commentary, Shankara aims his fire at the Buddhist theory that there is no enduring self. Instead, according to the Buddhists, there are only the momentary features and acts of consciousness called skandhas. These cause one another across time and aggregate to create the illusion of a coherent, enduring individual. Shankara offers several arguments to refute this. For one thing, it is hard to see how a skanda that exists only fleetingly at one moment can cause another skanda to exist at the next moment, for at the time it should be causing the new skanda to arise, it is already gone. Here Shankara is invoking a plausible, though of course non-Buddhist, assumption of his own, namely that effects depend on causes that exist simultaneously with them. Furthermore, the phenomenon of memory shows that the same individual does survive over time. For part of what I remember when I look back at a past experience is precisely that it was me who had that experience. When I fondly remember eating an almond croissant this morning, I am in no doubt that the person who enjoyed the taste of that croissant is the same person I am now. This argument about memory doesn't seem sufficient by itself, since the Buddhist has an alternative explanation to offer. It only seems that the former aggregate of skandhas is identical with the present aggregate because of the causal links between the two. But Shankara has already blocked this response when he insisted that the momentary nature of the aggregates prevents them from forming such causal chains. A more surprising diatribe against the Buddhists comes next. Shankara takes up a teaching of the Mahayana school of Buddhism, about which we'll be hearing a lot in future episodes. 
This teaching, called Vijnanavada, rejects everyday reality as an illusion. Shankara dismisses this scornfully. It is futile to deny that external things do cause our experiences, since this is patently obvious. Experience clearly involves both a subject and object, yet the various Buddhists being attacked here have managed to deny both, doubting both the existence of an enduring self and of real things for us to perceive. But hang on a minute. How can Shankara, of all people, be insisting on the reality of the world around us? Doesn't he, just like his Mahayana Buddhist opponent, take that world to be mere illusion? This is precisely the response made by Shankara's own opponent and critic, the rival Vedanta commentator, Bhaskara. He accused Shankara of rank hypocrisy, insisting on realism when responding to the Buddhists, only to fall into anti-realism when setting out his own Advaita teaching. The suspicion of inconsistency deepens when we look at other sections of his commentary on the Vedanta Sutra. For every passage emphasizing the illusory nature of all things other than Brahman, we can find another passage suggesting that Brahman does really produce the world we see around us by taking on form. We find Shankara emphasizing that Brahman can make the elements of things without using any instrument or pre-existing material, like the spider produces its web from nothing but itself. Or he insists that Brahman is the stuff out of which things are made, as well as being the agent that makes those things. Or he distinguishes between a higher and lower Brahman, the first devoid of form, the second a version of Brahman in which it takes on forms that make it available to our experience, or allow it to play the role of the individual embodied self. What is the point of all these assertions if the supposed things made by Brahman, and also the individual self, are nothing but illusions? A more sympathetic reader than Bhaskara might take refuge in historical explanations. Perhaps Shankara includes contradictory materials in his own commentary simply because he is reproducing ideas from previous commentators, many of whom were more realist than Gaudapada and then Shankara himself. On this reading, his Bhashya would be like a microcosm of the Vedanta tradition as a whole. One historian has written that, Since the Vedanta school itself split up and adopted ideas from the other schools, the history of Vedanta philosophy is really something like a miniature copy or reflection of the entire history of Indian philosophy. But is Shankara really so thoughtless as to compile disparate materials like this without even thinking to be consistent? That would be pretty disappointing, especially since it's in this same section that he insults the Buddha for putting forth inconsistent teachings. So let's consider other possibilities. Some scholars believe that Shankara's own ideas developed throughout his career, moving away from the radical teaching of Gaudapada and towards a more realist understanding of things. But a really satisfying solution needs to extract a philosophically defensible position from the commentary, and this is by no means impossible. Remember that for Shankara, we cannot just reason our way to the unique reality of Brahman. This is a truth found only in Shruti, a sacred literature that is rejected by the Buddhists. So, it's entirely consistent for him to say that the Buddhist has no basis for rejecting the deliverances of everyday experience. Furthermore, even once the authority of Shruti is accepted, Shankara does not believe that we should just immediately abandon everyday experience. This isn't the first move in his philosophy, it's the last move. Before we get that far, it is a useful step on the path of liberation to think of Brahman as a fundamental underlying cause of all things. We should then realize that effects are somehow implicitly present in their causes. The effect is not wholly non-existent before it manifests itself like the son of a barren woman, Shankara's nicely chosen example of a thing that cannot exist at all. If effects were not somehow prepared or pre-contained in their causes, Anything could be produced from anything, like clay pots made out of milk. While this account of causation improves on the Buddhist account, it is like an unfired clay pot, not yet the finished product. To go further, we need to make the further realization that effects are really nothing other than their causes. Pots are really just clay organized in a certain way. On this basis, we can make the further step of understanding the forms imposed on the underlying cause as in fact unreal. Shankara speaks here of superimposition. The guise under which Brahman presents itself is a kind of mask, 
and it is sheer ignorance to mistake the mask for what lies beneath. Or, to put it in more philosophical language, it is ignorance to confuse a real thing with a property that is falsely ascribed to that thing. Again, this can be illustrated with the false appearance of a seashell, which looks like it is made of silver. Only after following this fairly arduous and challenging philosophical chain of thought will we be ready for the radical conclusions of Advaita Vedanta. And, by the way, without the prompting of Shruti, we would have no reason or warrant to follow the argument to its conclusion. For all his philosophical sophistication, Shankara looks ultimately to the Upanishads as the sole source for our knowledge of the unchanging consciousness that is Brahman. Having looked now at the Vedanta Sutra and its most famous commentary, we are just about ready to move on to other schools. But first, we want to pause to consider another intriguing body of literature that emerged in the context of Vedic exegesis. We already know from our earlier look at Panini that the study of Sanskrit grammar frequently yielded philosophical insights. The same is true in the age of the Sutra. Even as all the schools, even those outside the Brahminical traditions, adopted Sanskrit as the language of intellectual discourse, Sanskrit grammarians were producing ever more nuanced works of linguistic analysis. And one of the most important of these grammarians, Bhatsrihari, apparently was another important member of the Vedanta tradition. So, join us next time and bring an apple for the teacher, because we'll be going to grammar school here on The History of Philosophy in India. Allah.